Welcome to our panel discussion on music, teaching, inclusiveness, and sense of belonging. My name is Steve Shanley, and I am a professor of music and education at Coe College in Cedar Rapids. And we are delighted to have this panel uh, this week because John Diversa is in town for some work in Cedar Rapids with the Five Seasons Chamber Music Festival and headlining the Iowa City Jazz Festival. So we decided we'd take advantage of him being here and get an opportunity to hear his thoughts on uh, belonging, teaching, inclusiveness, music as it pertains to his projects. And we have a couple of other special guest panelists with us as well. And so I'll start with letting John introduce himself and then we'll hear a little bit from our other panelists as well. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, looking forward to being able to, to talk about these important things. And I'm so glad to be here at the Iowa City Jazz Festival and, and be with the Five Seasons Chamber uh, Music Festival last week. Uh, I think you introduced me just fine. I'm, I'm a musician and uh, uh, you know, wanna, wanna get, give an opportunity for everybody to, to bring out their own genius in this human experience. So that's me. Well, welcome. I'm honored to be on this uh, panel and, and, and ask you some questions and stuff like that. My name is Blake Shaw, and I, I have a, uh, wear a lot of different hats in Iowa. Uh, one of my main jobs is I work with uh, uh, little kids, one to five-year-olds at the mm. Cedar Rapids and Hiawatha Day School. And uh, August, I'll be starting my uh, first appointment at the co uh, of, uh, Cornell College, directing the jazz band. And uh, I'm just a musician on the weekends, every single weekend, because I'm a bassist, so. I saw your tattoo, so I saw, I saw what was going on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm Steve Grismore. Uh, I'm the old fart here. Um, I've been on the Iowa City music scene for over 40 years. Um, one of the originators of the Jazz Fest and uh, been playing in, in local bands for, for many years. Uh, I was also an instructor. Uh, in the Jazz Studies Department at the University of Iowa for many years. And it's really thrilling to be here, to be part of this panel. I've been listening to uh, uh, Dr. Diverse's music, and boy, oh boy, uh, some great stuff and very interesting and wonderful music. So let's dive, like right, more. Let's yeah. dive right into that music, in particular the 2018 project you did for the... Um, Deferred Action on Childhood Arrivals, or DACA. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about just how that came to be, where you got the idea, and a little bit about the process? I remember the, the genesis of the idea came. I, I was speaking on the phone with uh, two other gentlemen, uh, one being uh, one of the executives on the, on the label that uh, I was on, BFM Jazz, uh, Stephen Weber. And uh, we were just brainstorming ideas uh, for the next record. And I also, uh, and we were, we were talking to producer uh, Kabir Sigal, uh, who we, we, we both wanted to work with. And, and so we were just we were saying, what could we do? And, and at one, one point we said, what, what about the dreamers? And then we were, we were just saying, what could we do to, to just spotlight the issue and, and bring it to more awareness? And what year was this when the first discussions started to happen? Uh, it was probably the year before. It happened very fast. Okay. Uh, probably 2017, I would have, I'm going to guess. Sure. Um, if not even later, because it was like once we had the idea, we had to go, and it was very timely, of course. Definitely post-2016 election. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. And it was in the news. It's one of those things you read about it, and it's, it's like... Um, you know, and, and you just, you know, what do you do about it? And, and of course, I'm, I'm a musician, so what, what I can do is, uh, is, is express it through music. And so we had the idea of, you know, what if we could take the, the music and just themes of, of, of America um, chosen in the music, and then we can go across the country and find uh, DACA recipients that are musicians and have them participate and feature them within the music uh, and, and really, and the idea with the project itself was not necessarily to say you need to do this or you need to do that, but just say, this is the issue. Did you know about it? And then you can research it and make up your own mind how you feel about it. Um, and so it created this incredible opportunity. I met all these wonderful people. You know, I, I wrote all the music in, uh, in six weeks and, 
And that's while I was, you know, full time chairing the uh, jazz department at, at Frost School of Music at University of Miami and, and all the other projects that I had going on at the same time. I was writing, you know, as always, like on the airplane and like in the middle of the night and, and just putting this all together. And that's before I had met any of the featured DACA artists that were going to contribute with us. Um, so were, the music had to be written in a flexible way that would work with whomever you met, or did you know them from a distance but hadn't met them in person? So you didn't know ability level, instruments, any of that as you wrote the music. That's exactly where I was going to go. Yeah. So I had to create all these places in the music where, you know, some places could be simple and some places could be like these little vignettes where they could play solos if they were really great players. and. Uh, and just, yeah, build in the, the flexibility. And I wrote sections where there could be a choir just singing, so maybe they, they, they may not have a lot of musical experience, but they could, they could sing, you know, unison in the choir, play percussion uh, in different spots. And, and so, you know, we were able to do that, and, and about, I think, 11 uh, uh, DACA artists came in and, and were with us in the first sessions in Miami with the big band and everything and the live sessions. That was, that was amazing. And then after that, uh, I traveled to, I had gigs already, you know, across the country after that. And so whenever I would go to a new state or a new city, I would find out, you know, were there DACA organizations in that area and meet some of the people uh, that were from that area. And then I'd go and, uh, you know, and interv interview them and have them, you know, overdub on the, on the record. And, and so I went to 17 different states doing that. And and, and the cool thing about that, too, was that a lot of times I'd go to uh, an area and I'd tell them what the project was because I'd have to find a studio and find a place to do it. And they didn't know about DACA. And so it was an opportunity to uh, bring up the issue for them and have them kind of check it out and tell them, you know, th these amazing people, uh, th their, own, their own narrative and their own stories through, through just what we were doing. So the... Can you talk a little bit more about that, about people who had not heard of this and were learning about it? Yeah. Do you mean people in the recording studio or who, maybe do you have an example of someone who had not heard about it and discovered it through this project? I remember uh, playing in a, uh, what was I doing? I was playing a concert and uh, it was in Oklahoma where, where I uh, grew up. I grew up in a small little town in Ada, Oklahoma, but we were up in... Uh, uh, Stillwater, I think, and uh, and I was looking for a studio, and and I was staying I was staying at uh, someone's house. Yeah, they they were hosting me there, and I was uh, telling them about the the issue, and and yeah, they they hadn't heard about it, and so we got to really explore what it is, um, you know, to to imagine to have the compassion for someone that may have come to this country undocumented as a child, say you're you're nine years old, and for you know. Uh, uh, infinite amount of reasons you know there's so many different stories maybe you know you came into the country with your with your father on a visa for a work visa that was going to expire at a certain point and then your father just took off and left you and all of a sudden there's no no and, and you didn't even know and all of a sudden you 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 graduate you go to school you work and then you go to uh, get a scholarship and they say no you can't get the scholarship because you're undocumented I didn't know I was undocumented, uh, or you know, you 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 can't get a driver's license. You don't certainly don't have a path to citizenship, um, and this is the only place that you really know that you, all your friends are here, your work is here, your your life is here, and uh, so you know to hear all these these different circumstances and to be able to explain that to people that had never uh, known about this situation, you know that's that's what I feel very good about. Uh, raising awareness about it and and it was such an amazing experience getting to meet all of these beautiful people and to know all their stories and uh, and now so that was you know five years ago and so now uh, many of of the people that I've met are doing so well and they're you know like Salvador was the clarinetist on the first track and uh, he played. He he uh, went to the University of Indiana, got his master's. Now he's married. He, uh, he's he's playing as a professional musician in in, in Indianapolis, and to see him thrive and many other uh, 
many other people that I met through the project are doing very well too. It's like your own family grew exponentially and they're all over the country and you can kind of take great sort of fatherly joy in watching watching what they all do. It does do. kind of feel like that. Yeah. You know? It really does. It's, yeah. it, it brings me a lot of joy. Well, Steve Grismore has one of the most impressive uh, record collections I know and is a very learned uh, uh, performer, artist. I'm curious what some of your first reactions were as you listened to this project. Well, I, on two different levels, it was kind of the idea of the, the project was interesting to me and to hear what the, the people were saying. You, you understand this, this is music going on, but there's this monologue stuff that occurs throughout the recording, which is a, 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 interesting, which you also do on an, another CD, which I find interesting what you're doing with that idea, which maybe we could talk about. But that, that part was very interesting to me in the stories. But then the music, the first thing I think, the first tune, I could be wrong, was the immigrant song, and I go, that's Zeppelin. I said, what's going on here? This is, you know, not a, per se a jazz record, but potentially. And then all the things you did with some of the Americana tunes and the arrangements with the big band, and I just thought, wow, what a wild, interesting thing. And there's, and of course on the other end of that was the quality of what was actually going on. I mean, your arrangements are quite cool. I mean, I, I would love to hear Johnson County Landmark play some of those big band arrangements here at the University of Iowa. I think that we'd be killing, you know. So that is, and then I of course did some research on this gentleman who I was very impressed with his uh, pedigree and all the places he'd been. And <clears throat> We have some things in common over just time in history, but it, but uh, a lot in common. Yeah, so I because I was a freshman at Miami and he's teaching there now, and I went through and looked at all the faculty that were there today, and you know, I got a sense and you know, like Daphnis and Brian Lynch and, and, and those guys, but you know, um, but guy, yeah, the, the, and then you're playing as it. I'm going off a little here, but he's a great trumpet player, and it was funny. I mentioned something to you about how he, the way he articulated. I asked him if he knew who Smoker was. Now you. And you're being very honest. You said you weren't aware of Paul, but after this all happened, sometime you need to listen to some Paul Smoker. Was I this hear that resemblance as well. Did you hear now that too, that Steve? you mention it, that right? yes, right? very much. Yes, because he really his technique extends things. And uh, can you tell uh, our viewers just give us a one minute synopsis of Paul Smoker? So Paul Smoker, uh, well, and I, I mentioned that uh, Orchestra Alta Maíz was this salsa band that played in Iowa back for 26 years, but Paul was an original member of that group. Oh, wow, okay. And, uh, but he also was a professor at Coe College. Coe College. And he actually gave me my first teaching job when I first came back from GIT and lived in Iowa City. So he was very important in my life, helping me just, just this idea of becoming a teacher had been, I hadn't really thought of that that much. I, th was, I saw myself as a performer more than a teacher at that point in time in my life. But Paul was really influential in all that. And he turned me on to all kinds of recordings and kind of kicked my rear end, if just to put it, he, he was an intense guy, but a great player. And over time, and then eventually Paul left Co and he moved out to New York. And he, he did a lot of really great projects with, him. you know, I mean, he would bring in heavy folks like he had Henry Threadgill at, at Co, uh, the Air uh, Trio, that's when he came. Uh, and then Paul got involved with people like, uh, Anthony Braxton and, and various other folks, uh, Ellery Eskel and a lot of great jazz musicians over the years. And Paul had this, you know, great, actually I think Paul's an important figure in the history of jazz, but, but he came, you know, just the humble beginnings yeah. at Coe College. Actually he was an Iowa graduate, but, but uh, yeah. yeah, so anyway. And yeah, now that you mentioned the similarity, yeah, you, you have to check that out, John. I will. Uh, Blake, what are you? Uh, well, what are I, you thinking? I have a question. Um, uh, I love we, earlier you were saying how um, it, you were being inclusive with this I information in in kind of a neutral way. But, you know, you know, you have you you were going in a in a, in a very particular uh, uh, direction. Um, but what I think it was a great idea to have uh, of them speak. A little bit about their story before uh, that, uh, an actual tune or whatever. But why did you think it was such a good idea instead of just putting it in the liner notes? Mm, that's a good question. Yeah. It's it just makes it that much more relatable. I, th I think that uh, especially considering that a lot of the music is uh, instrumental music, mm -hmm. um, and you, you can hide behind uh, the sound, and, and you can even hide behind the lyrics too when there is. Uh, lyrical content but you you get it was important to 
really meet the people. And sometimes we just, when we read about these issues, it's about numbers, but it's about the humans. And so I wanted everybody to actually meet them and, and really hear their story from their own voice because they're real people mm -hmm. having you know, real experiences with these issues. And, uh, and also, and, and the fun part was, was making the tie between uh, their story and their love of music, which is universal. You know, if you play music or you listen to music. And so every story, even on those narratives on the introductions, they all tell, talk about their connection with music as well. And, uh, you know, if, if it's just in the liner notes, you don't get to feel their frequency, you don't get to feel their energy. Mm -hmm. I loved uh, their, uh, th I loved the way that they spoke. You know, the phrasing that they were doing, I thought it, it was, you could tell that it was real, you know? I really yeah. enjoyed that. Yeah. And logistically, does the prevalence of streaming, did that play into this too, that people might be listening to the a track individually that maybe someone references or sends them a link and they don't have liner notes? Has that, has the, the prevalence of streaming for, forced you to evolve as, at all as you produce your music, write your music, share your music? For sure. I mean, it's understood that people, uh, there will be a certain amount of people that do listen to the, the album as an album and that the majority of people will be listening to it just this track and that track. Um, and, and the idea of liner notes is, is a beautiful one. It's a, <laughs> For the four of us. It's, it's an amazing, <laughs> notes, yes. amazing uh, beautiful experience that uh, is, is not a practical one in this day and age. Um, so, so yeah, you have to put everything out there in the front um, and make it, you know, be sure that it's, it's as real and sincere and genuine and authentic as it is. And, uh, and people will, will respond to that. You know, kind of on a little bit of the political side of all that, yeah. you know, I think the beautiful thing also is it's a lot harder to hate somebody mm -hmm. if you have to look at them or face to face with them, but to hear them speak, Beautiful. then they're just a number. You were talking about numbers. There's a lot more to it than that, right? And so I think as an issue, you know, it's not that everybody hates them, but you know what I mean? There's, there's this push in this country, there's a lot of negativity around those issues. And I think that's the great thing about that. It makes yeah. it a lot harder when you actually hear someone's story. How do you deal with that? Well, I always noted that. I mean, it takes a lot of courage, right? I mean, you, you, you read about something in, the, in this detached way, and you read about the numbers, and, and you, know, you can come to a certain conclusion. But then I find that when you actually meet somebody, and you're talking about their story, and you relate to each other on a human level, like all of that is, is washed away. Um, and then you can find, you can find solutions that... Uh, you know, that, that really find uh, integral compromises. So that's an important part. We have to, you know, we have to relate to each other on a human level. Otherwise, we are uh, ourselves uh, artificial intelligence. <laughs> We're that's robots. Funny. How has the, obviously... I'm sure the Grammy Awards were nice, uh, validation. Have you heard any other feedback informally, people who you didn't know, or maybe you heard stories, anecdotes, where the music touched someone in a way or, or brought the issue to them uh, after it had been produced and released? Many of them. You know, you know one thing, of course, is, is actually following the lives of the people that we got to work with and, and see how it's affected their lives, the, the success of just this project and, and how it's helped them uh, go further in their lives. And, but even one, one of the, the, the musicians, one of the artists on the project, uh, Rodrigo, he was a student of mine at California State Northridge uh, 10 years prior. I did not know he was a DACA recipient. And we, we put out a call when we went to Los Angeles, and you know, we were trying to find musicians that, were, that, that would uh, want to be part of the project. And he shows up. I said, Rodrigo, what are you doing here? I thought he, maybe he was just working in the studio or something. And he said, and you know, those things blow my mind. And then, of course, I, I found out that so many other people that I knew were, were part of DACA that, that I didn't know. I didn't know this part of their story. And so it just exposed uh, 
so much and, uh, and, and brought more compassion. And obviously you can't speak for all of them, but in general, are you noticing still great sense of fear? Is there a little more optimism? Is there, what, what, are, you, what are you getting there? It's all of that. Yeah, I think it's all of that. I think you know it's it's one of those things where, and I and I cannot speak you know for for a whole group of of, of people, but I I know that um, it, it's frustrating because it feels like you take a step forward and then they'll be put back again. There'll be another disappointment, and that happens so many times that you start to lose hope. And so I think there's uh, always a bit of caution inside any uh, uh, step forward for them uh, until they find a way that, uh, that they can actually participate in this country the way that everybody else can. They want to be able to vote. They want to be able to work. They want to be able to contribute to the society. Um, and, and many of them have been able to, to go past those, those challenges, and, and many others haven't. So everybody's on a different place with it. You had mentioned uh, a former student being involved. All four of us here um, enjoy working with college-age students and, and younger. I'm curious if you had any involvement. You mentioned in, in very brief passing <laughs> that you uh, coordinate the Jazz Studies program at the University of Miami. No small uh, job there in addition to all the other uh, things that you're doing. Were there any current University of Miami students that you had that could get involved with the project and maybe they learned about this for the first time? Can you talk a little bit about that, Oh, please? absolutely. And I learned from them. You know, it was really a, a collaborative community experience. Yeah, we recorded the project, the main part of the project, uh, on the campus of University of Miami because there's a, a recording studio there uh, that we can just barely kind of squeeze in and... Uh, and do it. And so since we're in Miami, I mean, the, the students there are playing at such an excellent level. Uh, I was able to, to bring in several of them to, to participate uh, on the project. And so they got to, to see the whole process and they got to, to intermingle with, with the dreamers and everybody was one and everybody got to tell their stories. And, and they were, and they, you know, when I asked them to participate in this project, you know, I, I told them exactly what, what it was about and what we were doing. And so, you know, they're, they're very on top of, of all of these issues and, and know what's going on uh, for the most part. So, you know, they were, they were trumpeting the whole thing all the way through. And I know that they, they go on and many of them now, uh, you know, are getting teaching positions in other places and they're bringing this kind of uh, awareness where they go. And that makes me, that, that makes me go like this too. I'm, I'm just so proud to be part of all of this. Did their involvement and then the, the involvement of many of the dreamers themselves bring a youthful energy to the project that maybe some of your other projects um, haven't had? If you're collaborating, as, uh, as Steve said so eloquently earlier, with maybe more of the old farts. Uh, <laughs> to the elders. The elders, the elders. yes. yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, the, the feeling of, of that project was, had such a mission to it. Um, it had such a purpose and a, you know, like a, this warrior spirit to it that uh, I would not think of it as being youthful. Even though, yes, there were a lot of uh, younger human beings involved on the project. Uh, this was, this was warrior spirit at any age. Like this wow. is, we're doing this uh, with a mission that has, it, it, it's so much bigger than any one individual. And honestly, when I'm working with a lot of my elder musicians, that's the one, those are the ones that have a little bit more of the youthful energy because <laughs> they're or playful anyway, uh, ironically. Very good. Anything else from either of you two on the DACA project? When, uh, kind of in a uh, composition uh, kind of question, mm -hmm. were you rewriting it all when you were in the studio, or was everything already set? You 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 set up everybody up to succeed in a way you planned beforehand, or how did that work? Well, I, I planned as much as I could, uh, you know, and had everything because because it's a lot of people. And, and the, of course, the arrangements that I wrote are, you know, incredibly intricate and, and involved. 
and then I had to uh, write in that good amount of flexibility of the unknown, which I didn't know, you know, who the players were going to be until we got there. So, so I had as much as I could fixed, um, and to the point where I even had all the we recorded everything to a click track, mm -hmm. you know, so it was just all on a grid. Because when I traveled to other places, I needed sure. to be able to go in an overdub and like, okay, it's just on this playlist and let's go. Mm -hmm. um, and so, what, but then once we were there and I met uh, the the artists that I had met before, I had to see what they could do. Mm -hmm. You know, what was, you know, what do you do? What, what do you? How can I put you in a position where mm -hmm. uh, you're going to really uh, be comfortable and, and and show what you can do? Um, so it was a good balance of that, you know. But but I but it was a controlled chaos. Cool. Uh, how many recording studios did you end up using? Well, I, 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 what did I say? I went to 17 different states, so I'm going to ballpark, okay. you know, 20 <laughs> different studios mm -hmm. uh, across the way. But most of those were just little, you know, one person doing an overdub. Sure. The main stuff was done in, in Miami. Uh, yeah. Can I ask tying into that? The, so just to understand, did you have all the tracks kind of laid out, ready to go, and then you dropped the DACA? Yeah, people I, in both the interviews and the music, and then they fit what they were doing within a certain parameter of what you had created. That's right. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I, I, I wrote all the music in, in six weeks, orchestrated, boom, 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 and then I created a, a, a temp track so that everybody could hear what it's going to sound like and study it. So we were already, you know, at least there was some form of familiarity uh, with this music before we got into it. And so, and everything was on a click and with the temp tracks on there. Um, and then we played over the temp tracks in the studio. So you live. drop a finale track into Pro Tools or something? Basically, yeah. 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 And I, but, but also, you know, put some live stuff on there too. Sure. To sure. make it as organic as yeah. possible so they oh, could really hear what the flavor is. interesting process, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, and then, you know, and then of course everything was played live because that's really important for me. Well, we didn't was... overdub this and then overdub that. I wow. mean, everything was played oh, live, oh, man. maybe in sections and places, you know, but it was played live. Right, played um, and all the improvisations are live. I mean, there's even that part on uh, uh, Don't Fence Me In. Don't Fence Me In, yeah. Which was a free thing, right? And, uh, and, it, and you know, it, we, we play the tune yeah. and then I, I play an open jazz, free jazz solo. And there's a moment where I just start playing kind of these blues riffs, and then everybody just starts answering call and response with it. And it's all out of time, and you have to do that live. You know, that has to be live, and then it all comes together, and that's that organized chaos, chaos thing. Yeah. And the chaos only makes sense if you can go back to structure. And the structure only makes sense, you know, if you can break it up again. Like I don't know if you know what uh, you know what cymatics is. Mm -hmm. It's you know, I'm familiar. <laughs> yeah, so it's like it's like if you put a a speaker on the floor and then put a put a metal plate above it and put some rice or even water on top of it. But let's say you put rice on it and you play a sine wave, like that, and then at certain frequencies, like at, at A equals 440, the the rice is in chaos. It's just like shaking. And if you drop it to 432, it, it forms this perfect symmetrical mandala. Hmm. And then there, there are just certain frequencies where it's, it's, it's chaos and structure and chaos and structure and chaos and structure. And that's you know, the concept that I work with all the time. You know, you got to break it up to come to the next level again. Do you have... I'm sure they're all special, but was there one particularly surprising guest artist where they ended up playing just, you know, so beyond what you would have predicted? Or, like, was there something that you walked away and thought, well, I definitely didn't wake up and anticipate that was going to happen today? Yes, uh, of course. I mean, so the, the first ones that come to my mind, I'll, I'll mention two. You know, one is a Daisy, who came in from uh, from Texas, and and she actually, you know, I was telling that one of the office managers at University of Miami what the project that we're doing because she saw all the people, and she said, you know, I have I have a friend that lives in Texas. And she's a really good singer. I said, 
have her sing something on her phone and send it, send it to me, and let's get her out here, you know. And she sang something on her phone, and it was, it, she had, she was a beautiful voice. So she came out and she sang uh, Deportee, mm. you know, and, and Deportee, of course, you know, is a poem. Um, and it was about, you know, the, the, the plane that crashed in, in Northern California, and, and every, everyone died on the, on the plane wreck. Um, and they were immigrant uh, workers from Mexico that were working the, the fields, and they were flying them back to Mexico. Um, and then in the, in, the, in the newspaper the next day, they talked about the wreck, and they mentioned the, I think this is right, they mentioned the, you know, the pilots and the people that were working the flight, and also the, 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 the deportees. That's the thing, yeah. You know, it's like heavy, heavy stuff. And so she sang this, this long orchestral uh, or arrangement that I did, because it has like six verses or something, and I had to, you know, you had to get, get every verse in. Um, but she was really emotional singing this, you know, and it was really hard to get through the last verse. And I remember, you know, we had to stop and just give it some time and, and kind of talk through it and, and just let the time pass. And, and then, and then trying to do it again. Um, and, you know, th those are the things that you remember. And then, you know, and just in terms of delivery, uh, there's a gentleman named Khalif who uh, is a spoken word artist. He's, a, he's rapping on the on immigrant song. And uh, he came in full of fire. Uh, he's, he's absolutely brilliant. And he came in, met him. My name's Khalif, John Diversa, pleasure. Let's do this. Uh, he heard the track, you know, the basic track that we wrote. He went outside, and I saw him <laughs> pace in a circle for maybe 20, 30 minutes, like this. And it was, you know, just like, and it was like seeing this all download. Head, not, not writing anything. Oh, yeah, was, all in his head. Yeah. And it's like seeing this download come down to his brain. And, the, and then he said, okay, John, I'm ready. He came in and, and did what's on the record. First, first take. Yeah. 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 It's like, okay, that was unexpected. That was, that was high level downloading going on. Is there a follow up project? Did this project encourage you to maybe think of a, a new direction you want to go with your music? What's, what's next as far as what this all created for you? Well, I was always thinking about the, the, I just feel like there's such a responsibility with music, you know, there's, there's, a, there's energy in every little sound bubble, you know, and, and I feel, you know, you can charge it with, with love, hate, pain, joy, whatever it is, and they're all valid, it's just being conscious about what you put out there. And so when I create a sound bubble, I, I want it, because I feel like it goes out and it just kind of circles around infinitely forever, and it creates a groove. <laughs> around the earth, if you can even imagine it that way. It creates this group. So, so I, want, I want the music to, on a higher level, uh, create a groove of, of love and togetherness, uh, as you mentioned, inclusiveness, and you know, raising to a place where we all understand that we're all in this together. We all are all the same. Um, so, I just wanted to be conscious music. So I mean, the, the, the record that I did after that, I, I produced uh, along with Kabir Siegel, uh, a record that uh, commemorated the, the passing of the 19th Amendment uh, for Karen Allison's sextet. And it was all uh, women on, on, the, on the band. Uh, and what did I do after that? And then, we, and then I did a record for uh, uh, Regina Carter uh, that was, you know, the message would just get out there and vote, you know, right before 2020. Just go vote, uh, and and we did, uh, you know, uh, we did some state songs and you know themes of, of every particular state of uh, of some of the swing states. That's what it was called, swing states, harmony in the battleground, um, and even uh, you know. And then I did a record, uh, Quarantena, of uh, with family at home, <clears throat> with uh, we joke about it, my boleros, because they were all boleros, and. It was, you know, the lockdown happened March 2020, and we were going to go in and record this record. And that didn't happen. Then I called him in June, and I said, hey, you know what? Let's do this. Yeah. We're all going to be in our individual recording studios. Uh, I feel like the best thing that we can do for our audience and for ourselves is to do what we do and go play music. And the amount of gratitude that I feel on that record, 
you know, of us all just being able to uh, play music that's important to us contributes to that groove. And, and the record I did after that um, is an orchestral record, uh, a jazz trumpet concerto written by my friend Justin Morell. Uh, and his son um, is uh, on the aut uh, autism spectrum, and he's nonverbal. And so this piece he wrote, it's, it's absolutely brilliant, and you can feel all the, the, the whole story, you know, of, of, a, of a father raising an autistic child. You know, the, the love, the pain, the frustration, the joy, all of it is in there. And he actually... Uh, recorded on his iPad, his iPad, his son just kind of singing or verbalizing a little bit. And that he chose, he found, was able to find and mine two little themes from that little recording. And that was the theme and then 10 variations. You know, so that also contributes to that groove of just creating awareness and togetherness and uh, the fact that, you know, everyone on this earth is a genius in some way. And everyone on this earth has incredible gifts. Everyone on this earth has incredible challenges, even if you can't see them. Um, and I would love to, to raise consciousness of, of, of that awareness, of that compassion. Uh, please talk a little bit more about that. And in particular, what can those of us who do not play the way you can play or write music the way you can write or t like what what can what can the rest of us be doing what 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 do you want to use your platform to encourage people to do to make this a more inclusive place and welcoming of all i i feel that everybody has that little tickle in their heart and that little tickle in their brain that, that guides them to that place. And if, if, as long as you're, you know, you don't need to do what I'm doing <laughs> at all. You need to do what that tickle is telling you to do, that little spark of, of passion, that little spark of, like, excitement. You know, sometimes it's really small, too, and sometimes it seems insignificant. Like, it, it could be something as little as, man, I really want some vegetable penne right now like that's a tickle and like the, and they, there even might be like a passion about it too like I can't wait to taste those vegetables and and then when you go have the vegetables you're gonna meet somebody at the restaurant and that's probably the reason why you had that tickle and that person that you meet there you're gonna collaborate and do this project that's gonna raise awareness in this other way you know it's like you don't have to try and solve it all and 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 big uh sweeping ideas, but follow that tickle. Just follow that tickle and, and great things unfold for your lives. And, and it always, you know, if, if it's serving you in those beautiful ways and filling your heart and filling your, your life, it's, in my experience, always reciprocated in service to the other too. And you can think about it as being service to the other person first, or you can think about it as being in service to your own life it, when it's in alignment, it goes both ways, in my experience. So I think just keeping it simple uh, from, from moment to moment, staying present. Woo, that's a big one. Staying present, because this is the only moment that exists. The future is unknown. It's exciting, but it's unknown. How do you stay present? By, by, by well... I know for me, with, with so many distractions, that in, I'll speak to it on a very practical way, in a practical way, you know, in the morning, I, I, I get up very, very early in the morning because I need to have that, that space for myself to be able to take care of everybody else after. You know, I have a daughter, I have a wife, I have uh, other, you know, all my other responsibilities. So I get up pretty early in the morning and, and uh, try to take care of my body, do some yoga or other exercises, and, and, and I meditate for a bit and just try and ground me. And I have, you know, through so many years, I've found different practices that, that help me find presence. And, uh, and it's let, that becomes a groove, too. So uh, when I'm able to put myself in that groove, then I, then I can 
then I can make it through the day in service to myself and service to the, to the external uh, before the next day starts again. I mean, that's kind of a rough... That's maybe, that's, maybe that's another, <laughs> another lecture to get deep into it. Yeah. I'm going to guess that you too might be curious about the Bolero Project and recording that during the quarantine where you could not all be together, especially a, a mus music where we're relying on oftentimes in person, oh, Steve played this, that's gonna make me wanna do, and one of the things that I discovered was that's really tough to do over Zoom with a little bit of a lag or whatever. So um, any questions or any, anything about that project that either of you have before I just ask him to tell us a little well, bit. Well, I, I love how you're kind of you're kind of like a Duke Ellington, where you you have all these people with these strengths, and you 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 really know how to put them together so that so that they work. Uh, how do you convince those people that their strengths are going to work in this way, I, especially for a project like that where you are doing everything remote? Or... Well, we we didn't do it remote. We oh. we we actually went in the studio, and and did it. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we were in our isolated rooms okay. doing it. So Got this person it. goes in, you close the door, and the, you know, like that whole thing. Mm. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I mean, that music is so interactive, mm -hmm. uh, and and you know, we didn't quite have the technology to be able to to, to play live, but remote. Mm -hmm. So no, that was that was we were all in the same building. <laughs> we were all in the same Different. building. Isolation booths. Yes. Yeah, you could head, headphone it out and go. Yeah, exactly. Could you see each other? Sometimes, sometimes. In some not. cases, I was in. A, I was literally in a closet with no windows. Uh, now this yeah. wasn't at the University of Miami. It was. It was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We. I mean, I talked to everybody, like all the administrators. I talked to, and I said, you know, we we want to do this, and I think we can do it in a safe way if we follow these these parameters. And and everybody was like, yeah, you got to do it. Kind of do it. So then you come out of the sessions and put your masks on and head out. I mean, right? Yeah. I, what, I mean, every. I mean, I guess I was the only one that uh, you know I was. Playing. You had, you had but to everybody take else off was and play. Masks. Of course, yeah. everybody else was masked. Yeah. I would just. My only comment to that process or at that time was the, the my last year of teaching. I've been retired for one whole year. Blake is kind of aware of this stuff too because he knows all the guys and gals that are in school at Iowa. But th that year of under COVID, trying to teach when we actually were trying to have ensembles. Oh. I mean, we had to wear, you know, the, the, wear. Well, masks for the rhythm section, you could be six feet apart. And then in our rooms, they measured, you know, it was 12 feet, feet apart for the big bands. The big band numbers were limited to 15. So we tend, sometimes had one or two less people than we wanted. Um, just the whole process. And then we could only rehearse for a half an hour. And then we had to take a half hour off to clean the room. And then we would go back into the room, and just the whole thing we went through for a year and a half, I guess, as teachers in this. I, maybe you could even comment on that at Miami, how you guys managed that. But that was same, a trip. Same situation. It was just hard. It was very difficult, and it was, it was emotionally exhausting. Um, and, and I have to say, you know, in the spring of 21 or what, whatever, I guess, um, I had a... Is that right? Been, I had a sabbatical. That was the end of the first full year of COVID, right? Yeah, there, right? yeah. so oh, and then you had end of 20, and then we started fall of 2020, and we were doing all of that. And then, yeah, so spring 21, I was on sabbatical. And so I was kind of like this, um, and, and all of my faculty members were, oh. were in it. And, and I came back. <laughs> I came back, I, I laughed sadistically, you know, I, I came back in, 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 uh, for in May to, to just have a wrap-up uh, faculty meeting on Zoom, you know, and oh man, I mean, everybody was just so exhausted, yeah. so exhausted. I've never seen all, of, I mean, these are like high energy, we're going to get it done. They were done. They were done. And, and the students, but the, the feeling that I had from the students and the faculty, but I'll just speak about the students. Um, the amount of gratitude that they felt. I mean, it was hard. And I think we're, we're going to feel the effects of that for, for, for many, many years. But they were so, they understood that everybody was doing their best. The students were doing the best. 
the, the faculty was doing their best, the administrators were doing their best in this situation, and the gratitude they had to just be working on their own mission, to be working on the music that they love so much, even in that capacity, when that could be taken away from them too, it's like, you know, this, this is what it is, but... At least we're doing this. This is, this is what makes me get up in the morning, so okay. Yeah, I, I thought those students were... I was impressed that they stuck with it. I give them all a lot of credit, because yeah. that was hard work for everybody. Yeah. I mean, the effort they had to put in was kind of double what you might normally do, you know, and it was just intense. It's deceptive because you're, you're processing a lot of emotions and information that you don't even know you're processing. And then you're processing all of the emotions and the information that you know you're processing. I mean, so much yeah. is happening consciously and unconsciously. Sure. And, and the end of the, of the day or the end of the week or the end of the month, you're like, why am I so physically, emotionally, mentally exhausted? I don't even know why. And, you know, so... I was glad to see everyone just kind of have some understanding that we need to cut some slack here and just, you know, understand that this is, this is, this is really deep stuff that it's going to take a while for all that sub and unconscious stuff to, to really come up to the light. I mean, I don't think we're even close to being there yet. I, I agree with that. You know, we, we had some concert situations where if someone tested positive, they were gone. And I had several major concerts that we still tried to hold that were, were streamed. Some, there were some audience members allowed in, in the Voxman Hall here at the school. But you had to find a sub at the last minute for a major concert and works that most, you know, to, to walk into and play, which you could appreciate. It was tricky, but everybody, the cutting of the slack concept, I think, was we knew where we were at. And this is the way it was going to be at this time, and there was not much else we could do about yeah. it, right? And yeah. so you went with it, you know? That's always, okay, so here's the situation. You know, how are you gonna, how are you gonna get the deepest impact out of it? Well, I mean, even just, if you'll forgive the, 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 the analogy, but like you show up on stage and there's a piano that's out of tune, and also, you know, that B natural goes That's <laughs> annoying. Yeah. So what do you do? <laughs> you know, how do you make it work with you and for yeah. you? Yeah. Um, yeah okay. Were there any things, call them silver lining, that COVID, the quarantine, all of that forced you to think about or do in a different way yeah. that you thought, <laughs> why, why haven't I always been doing this? Do you have a, a personal example or two of that? Yeah. Well, with a broad perspective, I know that, that what it really revealed to me was, I mean, I, it felt like this, this time period was like this, I, I almost have this image in my head of a, of a big conveyor belt, <laughs> or like going to the end of the waterfall, um, and everyone, no one can escape it, everyone's going to have to take this ride. You, you, can, you can try and run whatever, but it's futile, you know, everybody's going to take this thing. Um, and basically, it's a cleansing. You know, it's like uh, whatever in your life no longer serves you is going to be shed. So you can go kicking and screaming about those changes, or you can embrace the purity of where you want to go next. So that's what it did to me. It really put into perspective what I really want to do with my time and my uh, in my efforts, you know, and, and, and... Musically or everything? Everything. Yeah. Everything. And, and, you know, music is everything, and everything is music is all the same for me, you know. It's um, the way that I love my daughter. I, I understand that in the way that I love music, you know, the way I love my life. It's the way that I understand loving, you know, it's all, it's all interconnected and all the same. Um, but there, you know, just to speak more practically, I guess, there are many things that I, that I do, uh, you know, like this, this commission or, or that gig or, uh, you know, whatever those commitments are, or even that committee meeting, that doesn't serve my greatest mission, so I'm not going to do it anymore. So I can make room for something else to come in, because I think we as human beings, we have a finite, as human beings on the 3D level, we have a finite container of things that we can handle 
uh, the capacity that we're able to work with, the container does grow. I can attest to that. But we, we tend to operate where, where you know, the container is full of water all the time. And sometimes it just takes so much courage to let go of some of that water and then just, and just be okay with it being half full. And what inevitably happens is that something greater that you couldn't have even imagined comes right in because you let go of the other stuff. So it's really like that kind of purging for me these last couple of years. Okay, let go of the things that, that maybe were what you really wanted to do 10 years ago, but now it's a different moment now. So let's let some other things come in. That's great advice. Can we finish with a little uh, discussion about the Bolero project? Can you uh, talk a, a little more? You, we talked a little about the logistics that went into it in the sure. recording, but what about the genesis for that particular idea and sure. the music? That, that came from uh, Gonzalo Rubalcaba. And, and Gonzalo comes in and has an immersive week with us at the Frost School of Music once a semester. Um, and we become very good friends. And some of my favorite records in the whole wide world are the records that he did with Charlie Hayden. Um, and they're just with Ignacio Barroa is on there and Joe Lovano plays on there. And they're so beautiful, beauty. And, and every little nuance, every touch has a purpose. And, and so I was peppering him with questions about those records and I was, I was telling him, what, tell me about the origin of the bolero and, and what is it, it's just a boom, 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 is that all that really specifies what a bolero is? And he said, John. <laughs> and, 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 and he speaks so, so, he speaks the way that he plays, which I love. You know, you have to, to lean in a little bit, and it's, there's space between every word, and there's thought and intention behind everything, you know. Uh, but he was telling me, it's a ballad, you know, the, the bolero is a ballad. And, and we were talking about how in so many cultures, the, you know, Spain, Mexico, uh, Cuba, the, the ballad, these, these boleros were so uh, unifying for families because you would have dinner together as a family. And what do you do after dinner? You go into the parlor and play some of these boleros together with the violin and the, some percussion instrument. Maybe somebody has a, some sort of a guitar and, you know, simple melodies. And, and that's how the, the family bonds together. And I was like, yeah, I mean, that's how my family was. You know, my, my grandparents are Italian, Sicilian, and my grandfather had the accordion, and my grandmother was there with the maracas. And, of course, my dad's a professional uh, trumpet player, my mom plays piano and flute, and, you know, after dinner, we'd go and we'd, we'd jam, you know, uh, and so I was really s struck by that, and, and so then I thought, well, what if, what if I could do uh, a record um, that was all about family, and we could tie it in with the idea of the bolero, and Gonzalo and I can collaborate, and, uh, and then you know, my dear friend Daphnis Prieto, uh, wanted to participate, and my other dear friend, Sammy Figueroa, uh, who's played on every re record, you know, he's like, he, he, he was with Miles, he was with uh, Sonny Rollins, and, and Mariah Carey, and like, I mean, everybody. Um, and he's just a, he's so much fun to be with. And, and uh, Carlo De Rosa, who was uh, down in Miami at that time, we ha I had to use all Miami musicians, because, you know, everybody was just home. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and so that was another project, actually, also where, I mean, there's no rehearsal. When, how and where, we're not going to rehearse. Yet, you know, when I do a project, it's not going to be just going in and play tunes. So I actually uh, see, I, I, I did these temp tracks, uh, you know, where the, so everything's on click, and I got the arrangements exactly how I wanted them. Every key change, every temp, there's a lot of tempo changes. Uh, throughout the record and key changes and, and all these little subtleties. Um, and I actually played the drum part, you know, at home with my little snare drum 
And I said, Daphnis, forgive me, but I just want to give you, you know, like kind of what I'm thinking and a little percussion part. And I played the piano and I played the bass and I played the trumpet. And I sent these out to them and they studied the music and I gave them like a paragraph a uh, description about what every song was about. You know, there's one song that's about my grandparents, how they met in, uh, in San Francisco working in the canneries. And, and there's one song that's uh, about my, you know, uh, a great uncle, I guess, uh, Sergeant, uh, Sergeant York who fought in, in the war and uh, Alvin York. And, you know, all, all these different family members and my wife and my daughter. And, and my daughter said, you know, you're writing all these songs about all these family members, but what about our dogs? I said, you're right, dogs Hada. Dogs are family, you're too. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, we, I, I have uh, pupitas on there, which we, you know, always call them pupitas. And, yeah. Sergeant York, World War I? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. You guys yeah. know about him? It's a very famous... He, anyway. I do. I yeah. do not. Yeah. It's a yeah, famous my, movie my, about that. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. On my mom's side of the family. Um, and then I've also got, you know, three songs that my, my dad wrote, you know, so, and I grew up listening to those songs 30 years ago, so it was just an honor to get to play them and uh, rearrange them and re-envision them and put them on this record. And there's one song uh, that my grandfather wrote uh, that I don't even, I just remember it in my head. You know, it, we couldn't find it written down anywhere. I just remember him playing it on the accordion. And then another song that my mom's dad, my other grandfather, had written. So it was just, it was kind of a cathartic exploration and, and get to play with, with uh, these, these dear, dear friends. Be, they became friends of mine through the project because it was just such a bonding experience. And so that's why we call ourselves the Broleros. <laughs> Broleros, I love it, yes. And what's the reaction been to this? Are you hearing from listeners? What, what are you? It's actually, you know, Quarantena has been this slow, uh, I, I thought when it went out there, I was like, oh, I was, I was disappointed because it didn't seem like there was a lot of feedback. Uh, but it was just the time period that it went out. Mm. And, and actually, I was, I was at the festival last night, and I saw a couple folks, and, and they said, are, you know, are you, are you John Diverse? And I said, yeah. And, and they said, oh, we love your, uh, the, the Quarantena record. And, and I'm, I'm getting that a little bit more now. I think it's, it's been kind of this slow steady, kind of like Gonzalo Rubalcaba <laughs> spreading the word. So that, that feels really good. Because it's a really special album to us and, and uh, to feel it come back. It's like your babies go out and to know that your, your, your children are doing well feels good. There's a record, I want to know something about this because I've been doing this for a long time. I heard, and so I know who Scott Kenzie is, and of course, uh, uh, Haslip. Okay. So the Arc Trio record, what is that record? The, the, you did the music of uh, uh, M.S.M. Schmidt. Can you talk to, just give me a minute about that. Yeah, it's, it's really not my project, that, that thing. But you did a lot of the arranging of I that did, music? I, yeah, okay, right? so it's, it's Jimmy Haslip's project. It is, okay. He produced it, and uh, Michael Schmidt, is, uh, he's, he's a doctor in Germany. And he writes music, and he doesn't really play, and he's 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 kind of a, a you know he, uh, what's the word? I mean, a fan of mine, right? So so he wanted to have me on this record, and so and then the arc trio is uh, Giorgio and Jimmy and and Scott. Scott Kenzie's and it's like high end, super sciency, very uh, testosterone driven fusion. <laughs> Man, you know, it's like, <laughs> oh my God, it's it like is this the... kind of thing. So, so Jimmy says, hey, you know, would you write some horn parts to this thing that I did? And I said, yeah, yeah, you know, let's, let's see what I can do. And, and like Scott's got like, oh, you, guys... you know, it's like crazy crud. It, it is <laughs> and, a burning record. Uh, oh so my he, God. He sent me the tracks. And so I, I just did what I could with them. And I wrote big band stuff. Uh, like basically just an expansion of what was already there. That's all I could do. I tried to like actually do some more fancy stuff, and it just seemed like it's it's like uh, decorating the decoration, you know? Yeah. And uh, and so I did all these tracks with them, collaborated that way, and put on some solos and 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 that kind of thing. And uh, and he said, you know, would you mind if we called it the the Arc Trio with the John Diversa Big Band? And I was like, yeah, okay, you know. <laughs> uh, so it kind of kind of happened like that. I. The, 
you guys listen to this if you don't have it. I, I, what, what I want to say about it Get is... Get ready for some testosterone. You know, well, it's, it's, but you know, in all these things about the great music that you've created, what I liked about, and that's not your, your tunes per se, but what yeah. you contributed, but you know, in this world, it's, you're always looking for something out there that kind of pushes an idiom forward, mm. and I find that record to be very... Uh, cool. There's something new, because the textures, the, uh, the layers that yeah. are going on in that, with the improvisations yeah. over the written, the way you... It is an amazing, I listen to that, of course, the players are incredible, that's part of the key, Scott Kinsey especially, the, yeah. oh, the drummers, just, oh my God. It's a beast. But there was something in that, I'm thinking, no, I, I haven't heard any writing like that mm. for an ensemble, a big ensemble, the way this music is. It's really uh, cool. I'm glad to hear that. I mean, don't, I, mean I find it very forward. Good. Pu uh, pushing forward for the, for the music, I mean, Good. in a way that I was like, wow. Awesome. Awesome. Accidentally listened to that first, so sorry. <laughs> no. I, but then I listened to all the other things that you've done, which are no. wonderful. But I just well, Jimmy's you, know, a, you know that was a woo. Jimmy's a hero of mine, and 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 to get to collaborate with him, was, you know, every time he'd call me on the phone, it's kind of like, oh my God, Jimmy Haslam's calling, you know. Uh, that then you answer the phone. <laughs> then, then you answer. Jimmy yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You see Jimmy right. Haslam. Yeah. Actually, I missed a lot of it, but I but Jimmy calls. He's, yeah. he's yeah. kind of like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because yeah, so Grizz earlier mentioned he'd like to see the band here play some of the Dreamer stuff. Do you, are you? Do you sell that? Yeah. Do you have those charts available? The, oh yeah. Yeah, oh. they're on the website. Okay. And and was were there copyright issues with any of the? For that, no. Like they're just the, they're just arrangements. So yeah, I mean for the you like just pay the, the you pay the mechanicals. The, but but and then that pertain. You're allowed to sell the sheet music. Yeah. As long as you paid the mechanicals yeah. Yeah. for them. They're cool arrangement. That they're yeah. beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anyway, I just had to ask that question about that. Other to make one. sure, you know, if you um, uh, maybe I can grab the contact information for the directors and I can send them. You know, maybe I can give give a couple to them too, just to get them started. Happy to do that. There's some good yeah. bands out here in the Midwest. You, you oh know, yeah. The, yeah. The different schools that can play some of your music and sell yeah. a few sell a few charts. Of course. You know. you know, no, I mean, and that helps me too, just to so that people, more people, are aware of what I'm doing. And yeah, they check out the music, and and you know, spreads spreads the word in, in good ways. And my final question: What advice do you have for teachers? This is near and dear to my heart. I'm sending 21, 22, 23 year olds out to do what I think is the most important job at a time when that job has never been more difficult and certainly in some states like Iowa, mm -hmm. um, not getting a lot of support from... So what, what can we do? What, what can these young people do to create environments of inclusivity and trying to, trying to keep positive in spite of all of the challenges when they are working with these young students who are just have done nothing wrong except be born and show up to school. Because <laughs> this, is, this is a tough time to teach, and, and I'm sure, you know, tough even at a, at a great place like University of Miami. What are some lessons you've learned that you think could maybe be applicable to all disciplines, all, all ages? I certainly don't have it figured out, and it is a very, very tough time um, to do those, uh, to find those, Avenues certainly the ones that are that are more traditional, you know, to to get the teaching gig, to play in an orchestra, even to you know those. There aren't as many opportunities, you know. Even like my father played in the L.A. studios and played on every, uh, you know, TV and film, uh, you know, soundtrack there was, and now you know there's so many fewer opportunities for even that work and. But there's more opportunities in other areas, you know, where some, when something closes, something else opens up. So the world is so much more entrepreneur uh, uh, generated. So it's keeping an eye on those things. And you really have to be a self-starter. You can't wait for the phone to ring. You can't wait for the institution to tell you how to do something. You can't wait for uh, an organization to define something for you. I think it's really a time to be uh, looking at how you can create things here and then let it go out. Um, I don't want to go too much further into that, but I mean, uh, and then if you want to, to be in a place where there is a lot of competition, 
then you just have to be a total badass. I mean, it's just as simple as that. That helps. Like you, you have to stick out and find out. And, and, but I mean, it is kind of simple because all you have to do is find that tickle that I was talking about before. Find that thing that lights you up like nobody else. And just, and just with no fear, go at it. Go at it until the tickle's not there. And the only reason that tickle's not going to be there anymore is because there's a tickle somewhere else. And then you follow that. And if you're doing that with your highest excitement, highest passion, you're going to be a badass. And it's not just following that tickle, then it's doing the work, too, to develop the skills to express that tickle here on this plane. It's, it's really like that. And it may be in an institution, it may be not in an institution. But uh, to make it really simple, it's, it's, uh, it's not listening to all the noise that's out there happening all the time because that's just going to allow you to hear a lot of noise. You have to, to really understand yourself and know what makes yourself tick and know what turns you on. Whatever turns you on is going to turn on the rest of the world. It's just that. And just expect the unexpected. Whatever you have in mind for yourself, go at it with everything you can, everything you can and don't expect any of it to happen. It's going to unfold in ways that are even greater. Can't think of a better way to wrap up our discussion than those words from John Diversa. Thank you so much for being here. We always love having you here in Iowa. Thank Don't you. be a stranger. Come back. Thanks again to Blake Shaw and Steve Grismore. Yes. I'm Steve Shanley. Thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.